PlanetScale just released vector support for MySQL using a really advanced indexing algorithm known as SPAN. If you want to learn more about that, go to our website, follow the link below to check out some details about what we're offering. But in this video, I want to talk a little bit more broadly about what are vectors, what are embeddings, and why might you want to integrate those into your applications. One common use for vector databases and embeddings is to do semantic search. So the example that I want to show you to kind of motivate why we would want something like this is actually Hacker News. So let's take a look here. I have the homepage of Hacker News pulled up. And if you've been here before, you know that it shows articles and articles can be ranked. And hopefully the more popular articles are what are showing up on the front page. Now. Hacker News also has a search feature, so if you go down to the bottom, you can search for topics that you're interested in. So let's say I want to look up articles that have been submitted to Hacker News that are about hard drive disks versus solid state disks, right? That's probably something that has been talked about a ton on the internet over the past decade or more, and so there should be a lot of articles. So I'm going to go ahead and type down here, hard drives versus solid state disks and I'm going to go ahead and search this. OK, so the results are here. And as you can see, we only get two things showing up. So there's one article, HDD versus SSD. Are SSDs finally worth the money? Well, of course, now we know that they are, but that was from 12 years ago. And then one other article. So you'd think there should be a lot more articles that are talking about and comparing and contrasting hard drives versus solid state drives, but we only see two results here. So why is it giving us such a limited result set? Well, a part of the reason for this is many searches, including the one here for Hacker News, is doing some kind of relatively basic word search matching, right? It takes our search term either as a whole thing or breaks it up into tokens and then does exact word or string matching for substrings within whatever data it's searching through. So the reality is there were probably many, many, many more articles submitted to Hacker News that had something to do with hard drive disks versus solid state disks. But this search doesn't really know how to interpret the meaning behind what I typed in. Uh, it's just doing some more basic kind of searching. So we would like our search to be able to understand not just the exact keywords, but what it is that I'm trying to, that I'm intending to search for. What is it that I mean by hard drives versus solid state disks? And then giving me a broader set of relevant results for that. And we can accomplish that using vector databases and vector indexes and ANN search. So what is a vector? Well, really, a vector is just an array of numbers. Typically, in vector databases, we're storing these as some kind of float, oftentimes maybe float 32, but there's different representations. If you want it more compact, you can use float 16s or even float 8s. But it's an array of a bunch of floating point numbers. So how is that useful for capturing the meaning of things like searches? Well, where this becomes more useful is when you pair a vector database with some form of embedding model that can generate vectors that have meaning embedded into them based on content that was given to it. There's many embedding models out there that essentially what you can do is you can take an input, a string, a blog post, even image data, you feed it into the embedding model and what it spits out is a vector. That vector could have hundreds or even thousands of floating point numbers in it. And somehow that model was able to generate an embedding that stores meaning about that input. So how does it do this? What do I mean by storing meaning in an array of numbers? Let's think about a simple example using just one dimensional space. When we think about vectors, if we have, say, a vector that has 500 elements in it, we can actually think about that as 500 dimensional space. But we'll start smaller with a single dimension. So let's draw a line. And let's say that this line represents how fast something is, 0 being very slow and 1 being very fast. Let's put a few things onto this line to see how this correlates and maps onto this one dimension. So for example, a Ferrari would be very close to a one because it's very fast. Molasses would be close to zero. A dog might be somewhere in the middle. A cheetah would be faster than a dog, but slower than a Ferrari. So we can take an input, these physical objects, and we can map it onto this one dimensional space for what this thing actually means. And when we see things that are closer together, that means they have more similar meaning in our space and things that are farther away have a more different meaning. 
So that's one dimension. Let's jump to two dimensions. So let's say now that our x-axis represents how fast something is, and the y-axis represents how loud something is. So a Ferrari, that's very fast, and it's also very loud, so that would go into this position. Molasses is not very fast, and it's also not very loud, so that would go here. A dog is kind of medium fast, but dogs can be loud when they bark, so that's gonna go in this position. And then the cheetah finally is very fast and also has the potential to be very loud, but is not necessarily known as a loud creature. So now we've added another dimension and we have more ability to map input objects onto our space, our vector space that we have. Okay, going up to 3D space, we'll use speed on one axis, how loud something is on another axis, and how large something is on the other axis. So Ferraris are big, they're fast, and they're loud, so that will go here. Molasses is generally gonna be purchased in small quantities. It's slow, it's not that loud, so it goes way down here. A dog is sort of medium-sized in this arbitrary sizing that we're doing, and uh, loud, fast, sort of medium speed, so we're gonna put it right here, and then the cheetah will go here. Now here I'm only showing three dimensions, whereas some models that generate embeddings can generate vector spaces of thousands of floating point numbers. So they can capture a lot more meaning than just this. But the other thing to keep in mind is the vectors, the embeddings that you get back from an embedding model don't necessarily cleanly map to things like speed and size and so on and so forth. They're sort of this opaque meaning that the model is able to capture. And when you compare one vector generated by the model to another, that meaning related relative to each other means something. But as humans, you can't necessarily just look at a vector and go, oh, that thing is fast or that thing is slow. Now. There's a number of different ways that we can generate these embeddings, and generally it has to do with taking your input and submitting it to an embedding model. One option that you can choose is something like OpenAI's Embedding API. You can go to their website and check it out. I have the docs pulled up here. So this is their embedding model, and as you can see, they even have a little uh, announcement here that they have some new embedding models. But these are things where essentially you can submit things to their API to get embeddings and get results sent back to you. Uh, interesting thing to know, right? By default, the length of the embedding vector will be 1,536 for their text embedding small, or 3,072 uh, for their text embedding large. You can reduce uh, the size of the embeddings by passing in a parameter and so on. But basically, using some of these really powerful embedding models, you can get some really, really large embeddings and optionally compress those down if storage-wise that's too big or if that's overkill for what you need. However, using APIs like this costs money and it's not something that you're doing locally. You can also generate these locally using some various frameworks and I'm gonna show you one in Python. So here I have a simple Python program pulled up and this uses the sentence transformers library. So what I'm doing here is importing that module and then I'm basically creating or requesting to create an object based on a particular model. So you can specify different ones. I'm using all mini LM, L6, V2. And this is one that's small enough where my computer is very capable of running this just locally. So then, as you can see, I've got two example sentences. One is the dog chased the mailman, and then I have the other one. And in terms of thinking about the semantic meaning of these, these are quite different in terms of what these two sentences are trying to communicate. I go ahead and ask the model to generate embeddings for those. And I'll go ahead and run this and we'll print out what those embeddings are. So I'm gonna say python3 embeddings.py. This will take a few seconds to execute to get the model loaded up and everything. But once it finishes, you can see that it printed out two very long arrays. So this is where the first one ends. We'll go up to here. So starting up there, quite a few floating point numbers it ends there, and then there's the next one. So even though these are smaller than OpenAI's defaults, these are still very big embeddings. Now the other thing you can do, looking at the commented out code, is you can take a look at how similar two embeddings are to each other using this model. So let's go ahead and ask it to do that. It's gonna rerun the whole program, generate those embeddings, and then show us a similarity score. So that similarity score is right here. So it's negative 0.0411. So a very small number indicating that these are not very similar. 
These are very dissimilar sentences in terms of what they mean. But if I were to run this again, and I could change this to a sentence that means something more similar, like the coyote chased the delivery guy, that has a little bit more of a similar meaning. So we'll run this again, and what we should see is a much larger number than 0 0.01, and there we go. We see 0 0.5, significantly larger, representing greater similarity in terms of what this embedding model was able to embed in terms of the meaning and how similar those two sentences are to each other. So how could this kind of thing help us when it comes to doing similarity search? Well, let's think back to our Hacker News example. In fact, let's go pull that up. Remember, I searched hard drives versus solid state disks and we only got two results, but the reality is we know there's gotta be a lot more. Let's say I searched instead for HDD and SSD. Just putting those two things in, right, all of a sudden we get quite a few more results. So it would be nice if based on just my original result, if somehow the search could know things like when I say hard drive, that basically means the same thing as an HDD. And when I say solid state disk, that means the same thing as SSD, rather than restricting ourselves to exact keyword matches. So something that could be done to improve this, if you were building this search, is to say, Okay, every time the user types in a search term, I'm going to take that search term and generate an embedding for it. But then previously, you would have had to generate embeddings for everything in your data set. So basically generating an embedding in the database for all of the submissions that we've ever gotten to Hacker News. Then what I can do is I can take my embedding from my search keyword and ask my database, find me rows that have a similar vector to this embedding. And you can ask for the 10 most similar or the 50 or the 100 most similar and have your database find those, give you those rows with similar embeddings back to you and then display those results to your user. What this would allow is because it's basing the search on the embedding similarity rather than text matching, it would actually know something about the meaning of what you typed into search and give you things that have a similar meaning. Now this is something we're not gonna have time to implement in this video, but in a separate video, I'm actually gonna show you how we can do something basically like this using some data that I'm gonna scrape from Hacker News. So stay tuned for that if you wanna see a hands-on example of using MySQL vectors in practice to build a really cool feature in a product. Okay, so that's it. That's what vectors are, that's what embeddings are. I hope you learned a thing or two here. And like I mentioned, if you want an actual hands-on example, go ahead and hit subscribe to our channel to stay tuned for the next video that's gonna drop on how you can use MySQL vectors powered by PlanetScale. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for being here. I'll see you in the next one.